Okay, I think we can nearly get started. So, welcome everyone. My name is Pip and I'm the Future Workforce Program Lead for the New South Wales Rural Doctors Network. And on behalf of RDN, I'd like to welcome you all to RDN's inaugural Rural and Remote Nursing and Midwifery webinar series. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of all the lands in which we are meeting on today and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. So we're beyond excited to share this initiative with you all and be part of your nursing and midwifery journey, whether that be into rural practice now or later in your career. At RDN, we are determined to provide appropriate support, however possible, as you enter and undertake a career in rural and remote practice. I come from a rural and remote nursing background myself and am extremely passionate about this area in not only nursing, but health in general, and hope this series of webinars provide you with the skills and knowledge required as you move into your transition to practice program and career. We have an incredible lineup of speakers throughout the series, and I hope by sharing their knowledge, experience and learnings, you will be able to follow their footsteps as you enter a career in rural and remote health. So before we get started, um, we'll just go through a few housekeeping things. First of all, um, especially for those new to um, Zoom, you'll see down the bottom of your screen, there's a chat function and a Q&A function. Um, throughout the webinar, and we've already started, i would ask you all to post in the chat function if that's okay. Um, we want to make this as interactive as possible and I'd love as many questions as you can think of to come through. So feel free to post questions or comments throughout the, the session and we'll either address them as we go or we'll, we'll leave them to the end and we'll do a, a Q&A session. Um, but yeah, feel free to pop them in there. Um, also, if you have any technical issues, just let me know and um, or just pop it in the chat and we'll make sure you get some assistance along the way. Uh, at the end of the session, we're going to put a little uh, link to a survey in the chat and make sure that um, you can access it before you leave. And that will be basically an opportunity to go through and let us know things that worked well or didn't work so well and ways that we can improve um, in the future and support you guys however possible. So it'd be really great if we could get that filled out um, tonight um, and then we can you know, try and improve things along the way. Um, you'll also get a thank you uh, email tomorrow, probably in the morning. Um, and that will have a link which will redirect you to a um, a digital venue hosted by Rural Health Pro and that will be a place where we can uh, share the recordings and also give you access to some resources such as the um, transition to practice handbooks and anything else we think you guys might um, find useful. Um, we'll also be able to continue conversations and chats there about your process, your sort of application process and any other things you might find interesting about rural and remote practice. Um, Okay, so with me here tonight, I have, of course, Sam Quamby, our guest speaker, but I also have Chris Russell, the Future Workforce Manager at RDN, um, who I'd like to introduce to say a few words. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Pep. Hi, everyone. Um, look, it's just a, a quick hello from me. Um, Pip uh, and Sam will be doing all the hard work this evening. I'm just here to say hello, uh, hopefully to um, put a face to the name. My job is essentially to find people that might be interested in working in a regional or a rural or remote area um, and then to do whatever we can to, to support you get there. So just wanted to put a face to the name. I'm hoping that I might um, meet and help some of you in the future. Uh, so yeah, we just wanted to do that tonight. I think we've got a great series. So as I said, I'm not here to take up too much of the talking. Um, Sam will be doing that. I'd just suggest make the most of this. You've got great... Um, great opportunity to hear what Sam has to say and then to ask questions um, of all of us at the end. So yeah, get involved, um, chat, let us know how it's going as you go. Um, and yeah, en enjoy the session. So I'm now just going to hand it over to the RDN CEO, uh, Richard Colbran, who has a message for everyone before we begin.
Hello, my name is Richard Colbrand and I'm the Chief Executive of the New South Wales Rural Doctors Network. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for our digital series on nursing and midwifery. We're thrilled to bring it to you and we hope you get to enjoy uh, this four-part series. Before we start, I'd just like to pay respects to the traditional owners of all the lands across New South Wales and Australia on which we meet through this digital venue and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and also just pay a very special um, thanks and acknowledgement to all of our Indigenous friends and colleagues who are involved in nursing and midwifery across the country. Over the last few months, ADN has worked hard to, to bring together a whole host of um, digital events relating to clinical topics and networking for our rural health professionals, and this series forms part of that. And we've got four events to bring to you over the coming weeks, and today is the first of those. And I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Samantha, who's the Director of Nursing and Midwifery in Dubbo. And uh, the first session um, will be hosted and talking about the Transition to Practice Program, the TPP uh, for Application Processes and Interviewing Skills. The session will cover how best to approach your application, what to include and how to prepare for an interview, and what employers are looking for in an applicant interested in rural and remote nursing and midwifery. So once again, thank you. For joining us. Uh, hopefully you'll get a lot out of this series and our staff at RDN are available and willing to help in any way we can to support your journey and transition into practice really and uh, please make sure you get in touch with us if you have any questions. All the very best and enjoy, enjoy this session. Cheers. Hello my name is... Okay so it's with great pleasure that I introduce the first speaker of our series to you all tonight, Samantha Quamby. Sam is the Director of Nursing and Midwifery at Dubbo Health Service, a large rural referral hospital in central west New South Wales. Sam grew up in a small town in the central tablelands of New South Wales and commenced her nursing career at St Vincent's Hospital as a trainee enrolled nurse before completing her registered nursing degree through the University of Technology, Sydney. A new graduate position at Broken Hills provided Sam her first opportunity to work in rural and remote locations and witness the variety, complexity and autonomy that rural nursing has to offer. Over the years, rural nursing has never prevented Sam from being able to work in a diverse range of positions in small, medium and large rural health facilities, including clinical nurse specialist, clinical nurse educator, after hours manager, disaster manager, student midwife, midwife, nurse unit manager, and deputy director of nursing roles. Sam is committed to providing excellent clinical care to rural patients as close to home as possible. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, take the opportunity to share my screen and uh, bear with me um, while I do that. And How am I, Pip? Yep, looks good from my end. I just also want to quickly remind everyone that we're recording this, so if you miss anything and we want to go back, um, it will be available. Excellent. So good evening, everyone. This is quite a, a new experience for me. Um, I've certainly spoken um, and educated in front of, of groups before, but not sitting in my office uh, late of an evening now talking to my laptop. So. Um, I'm much more of a people person, but you know, I, I do. Um, I applaud the uh, Rural Doctors Network for the innovation in in um, putting this together, and uh, rural workforce, uh, not only as a, a rural clinician but as a director of nursing, is something that I'm incredibly passionate about because I'm very much of the belief that rural pa rural and remote patients deserve the same quality of care that. Um, our city counterparts um, receive every day and and um, part of that receiving that care is, is being able to um, to attract um, new new uh, workforce out here so um, I look forward to having a chat with you guys tonight um, this is a combination of my own personal experience um, and a, um, my experience as a, a director of nursing um, in regards to recruitment so just a bit about myself. Um, I have been a rural nurse uh, since completing my new graduate program in Broken Hill um, quite some time ago now. Um, but 
to uh, let you all in on a little secret. I actually didn't receive my first uh, preference when I went through consortium um, at the end of my nursing degree. So um, life was not over for me. And it turned out that actually being sent to Broken Hill was one of the best experiences of my life um, from my nursing perspective. So um, I'm actually presenting on transition to practice tonight. And what we are going to be talking about is your application process and um, actually getting through an interview. So I've been interviewed many times, especially in the past three years. And I've also been on many, many panels um, and employed a range of staff and across a range of specialties, including nursing, midwifery. Um, I'm a nurse representative on senior um, medical officer panels here in Dubbo. Um, and I've been on allied health and, and health support panels. So um, I do have some experience in regards to um, uh, not only preparing my own applications, but actually reviewing applications um, and, and deciding on who we might transition to an interview. So now just a note, all of these photos um, tonight, um, I like color um, and I certainly like photography have either been um, sourced from places that I've worked or places that I've visited during my um, career. So if you don't have the desire to work rural, I guarantee you my intention is to make you want to work rural by the end of this. So um, that's the scene from Broken Hill for the first one. Okay, so the application process. So how to make sure that you actually get an interview. This is the foot in the door process. So in 2019, for our facility here in Dubbo, we had over 60 applications for 28 new graduate positions. Um, getting an application uh, through and writing the right application is the first step in getting noticed and securing yourself a position, um, whether that be as a new graduate uh, nurse or midwife, or whether that be into a student midwifery program, or perhaps you've, you've been working as a nurse for some time and you wanna transition into a new area. The application is really, really important. So how to write an application. So the first thing that everyone needs to remember is that first impressions really do count when writing an application. So my advice to you is make it count. Remember, even though uh, your colleagues at, at university or your lecturers know you, um, potential employers don't know you. Uh, so your application needs to highlight what you're capable of, where your knowledge is and the experience that you have had um, and, and experiences that are relevant to the role. So my top tips for writing an application are to read the eligibility criteria, to ensure that you read the selection criteria and that you understand what each of the questions are asking. And when you understand that, ensure that you answer and address, that your answers address the whole question. Now I've got some examples coming up that we're gonna talk through in a moment, um, just to give you an idea on some of the things um, that we see as employers come across our desk for applications. And I wanna highlight some really successful applications and, and answers and some of those that um, could have benefited from some more work. So during an application, what do we want to know? So there are a couple of things and I've highlighted four words or terms here um, that are really important to me as someone who's reading an application. So the word current, so it seems really trivial, trivial these words, but they're really, really important. So current mean in an in a eligibility criterion application means that you need to show that you have current something. Now that might be current registration or current experience. What we, hear, what we want here are the facts. Um, so if they're asking for current experience or current registration, we would expect that you would provide evidence of that. Eligible, so when the word eligible appears in an application, it means to provide details that you're able to meet the requirements for registration. So for example, uh, we often uh, put advertisements out for um, midwives and we will open up the application for student midwives who are eligible to register. So those that are finishing their program need to provide evidence that they're eligible to register um, as a midwife prior to, to actually being um, employed. Evidence of means that we want to see evidence of your knowledge or evidence of your experience. So um, that usually requires some sort of example in your answer. 
Now demonstrated, now this is probably the one word that is used the most often in an application and the one thing that um, really uh, pulls people up during an application. So demonstrate is one of the key areas that um, of applications that fall down because um, candidates often fail to understand what we're actually asking. So what we want is not only knowledge, but examples of your ability to translate that knowledge into practice. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So I have a couple of um, examples here, a few slides of examples. So the first top example here is must have a class one driver's license. That, that's common. Um, and in the rural sector, that can be um, a, a question that is very valid to ask. So in the first example right here at the top, you'll see that the applicant has written yes. So technically there's nothing wrong with that. However, below is a very simple answer that actually provides us with the evidence that they have that. I have blanked out the license number, um, but they have, yes, I do, and then provided us with the license number. So that is my preferred um, answer to that question. The next question, uh, the next section underneath, so number six, demonstrated effective clinical communication through the use of information technology um, is, a, is a very, very common uh, question in an application. Now, this is half of the answer. I couldn't actually screenshot the whole answer. But what we see here is the answer is detailed, but it fails to demonstrate anything. So what happens here is that people are desperate to get our attention and that's awesome. Um, but what we don't see is their ability to translate knowledge into practice. So you need to remember that you may be one of 10, 20, 30 people going for a position. So we would encourage you not to copy and paste from a policy or um, ethics guidelines or from a website or from someone else's work because there has been multiple occasions where we'll get applications across our um, desk and we can see patterns emerging in the answers. And that's usually due to the fact that they've almost word for word actually provided us with the policy statement or the um, practice standard. So providing us with some knowledge is awesome, but we need that demonstrated. So one of the scenarios that I use when I um, talk to people on my panels is that I can um, provide you with knowledge around how to fly an aeroplane, for example. I can provide you with basic aerodynamical, aerod aerodynamics and instructions on how to take off in an aeroplane. But it doesn't mean that I'm capable of doing that. So what we want to see is we want to see registered nurses and registered midwives, students or otherwise, show us that they know, but that they also can demonstrate that they know. So demonstrated is one of the areas, and I've got some really good examples coming up to show you what, what we really enjoy seeing. Before I get to that one, um, the top one here, recent clinical experience in critical care. So this was an advertisement that we recently had out looking for staff to work in our ever expanding brand new multi-million dollar, yes, I am plugging Dubbo right now, um, intensive care service. Um, unfortunately, this applicant has written nil experience in critical care. The honesty I completely admire. But this is a two-part question. Um, so recent clinical experience in critical care is the first part. And the second part is joined by the end, commitment to quality improvement, practice development and evidence-based practice. So a really clever thing to do if you are in this situation is to acknowledge that you don't have the critical care experience. Tell us how you might have tried to obtain it. So you may have done online learning, you may have done some training through RDN or through HETI or um, some external services, but you've also committed to quality improvement, practice development and evidence-based practice. So leave us with a, with a positive thought because sometimes that's enough to get your application through. The next one down here is an example, an excellent example that I've pulled this afternoon of how to show demonstration. So we were asking here, demonstrated ability to practice in accordance with the standards. So this answer here has acknowledged the standards and then provided us with examples. So during my experience or an elderly lady presented, so she's given us, um, she or he, has given us some evidence that they know how to put this into practice. 
Okay, some more really good examples. So current authority, so we talked about current. Um, so this person here has provided their registered nurse um, number, um, which is obviously blanked out. And then they've given us some food for thought. So um, I have X amount of ex uh, years experience in a large number of clinical settings. So already we're thinking this is someone that we would really like to work in our facility. The next um, example underneath is actually um, this, the same applicant. Um, this is an excellent application. So demonstrated effective clinical communication. So this, um, she's pro provided a leading sentence here. I value communication and the importance of actively listening. And then she has demonstrated that with the term, for example. So for example, when making an addiction management healthcare plan, with a new patient and then she has gone on and explained that. So that, that gives us a lot of reassurance that not only um, is the knowledge present, but the ability to demonstrate the knowledge is there as well. This is a, another example underneath um, from an enrolled nurse application that we had recently. Again, we're looking for demonstrate. She's actually chose to use the word demonstrate um, and then um, provided as an example, nurses by ensuring I ask for consent. So. Um, also a really good um, application. I can come back and visit any questions you might have about application um, at the end of the, the seminar. Okay, so you've put an absolutely amazing application in. We were really excited and now we're going to progress you to the interview design, uh, to the interview. So I'm not sure how many of you've done interviews before. But within health, um, we use a particular style of um, interview, which is typically called behavioural interviewing. So now that you've secured an interview, let's have a look at what we do. So the purpose of the interview is to allow us to sift through all the candidates that we have, to identify and select those that we feel as an organisation, um, regardless of the size, that will best fit our needs. So behavioural interviewing aims to determine whether you have competency in the core aspects of your role. Um, and this includes basic knowledge, knowledge and skills. So typically in health, the core competencies that are really focused upon is teamwork, decision-making, escalation of care and the deteriorating patient and conflict resolution. As an interviewer, I will be always looking for evidence of examples of past behaviour that show me that you have that core knowledge and that the competence is there. So how do we prepare for an interview? That is the million dollar question really. So it is essential that you prepare for the interview, but the question is, is how much preparation is enough and how much is way too much? And there is such a thing as way too much. So there's loads of information online um, and probably YouTube as well on uh, how to prepare for your interviews. And I am aware that some universities um, are supporting students um, in preparing for interviews. So not all advice is equal and I'll, I will give you my top three tips um, here. So planning ahead is really important. Researching the industry and the organisation that you are applying to is essential. Um, we have had people um, apply for positions out in, in the rural setting that are not aware of where, where we're located um, and not aware of any of the, um, the in intricacies of the communities that we look after. So I would recommend researching where you want to go um, and, make, and, and that helps you make an informed decision um, when you're putting your application in. Also know the role. So perhaps not as, um, as essential as a new graduate, but certainly as you progress through your career and you look for new opportunities to extend your skills or to transition into a specialty area, it's really important that you understand the role that you're applying for. Understand your strengths as well, okay? So it's, it's a real challenge to try and sell ourselves. Some do it better than others. But it's important that you understand your strengths um, so that when you get into the interview that you can certainly sell your strengths. My um, top three tips are highlighted in the next three. So prepare for common interview questions. Now there will always be standard interview questions and we talked about some of those core competency, competencies before. Um, a lot of them are around teamwork, 
um, escalation of care, um, communication and conflict resolution. And certainly the new graduate interviews that we did last year had questions around those themes. I would encourage everyone to prepare notes, to read those notes and then to screw them up. And I will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, it is good to know your concepts. It's good to know your knowledge, but you need to know them and be able to translate them as opposed to rote learn them and, and provide them to a panel. My other big one, and this is a tip that I was given um, about two to three years ago, was always ask the interviewer a question at the end of your interview. Um, I was uh, happened to be an independent on an interview panel um, for a mental health position um, and was sitting with the director of the services at the time. And, and she said to me that she's always hesitant um, for people that don't ask the interviewer a question because it means that um, they're not overly engaged in the process. And I, that's always stuck in my mind. Um, and certainly I look to see those candidates that have questions prepared for us um, at the end of an interview. And my last one is practice, okay? And we can um, talk about that. So what I mean by practice is don't learn word for word your responses to your answers, but um, practice being put on the spot, you know, um, as a group, uh, as a university group, maybe get two or three of you together and throw questions at each other and practice actually having to process what the question means um, and how you may or may not answer that. So this is the uh, this is the big um, the big sticking point for a lot of people that are going for a job. And I spent some time with my deputy director of nursing this afternoon, who um, whose primary um, portfolio, uh, as well as lots of other things, is around recruitment. And we had a conversation around um, selling yourself at the interview. Look, we all understand that um, trying to sell yourself um, in interviews can be really really challenging for some people. Um, believe it or not, it's actually nerve wracking for panel members as well, because we are super keen to get the right person, um, because we know that um, our patients depend on having the right person looking after them. So we want to get the best out of you during an interview. We don't want to trick candidates. We don't want to stump candidates. We know that they're nervous. Um, and certainly interview panels that um, I'm in charge of, we really try and make our um, our candidates feel quite relaxed, but we um, we really need you to try and sell yourself because it's your one shot of, of really um, making yourself irresistible to us. Okay, so on the day of your interview, we know that you'll be nervous. Um, that is incredibly normal, um, possibly excited, um, possibly terrified. That is incredibly normal. Um, and pretty much I would say 98% of every candidate, uh, of all the candidates that we interview feel like that. So what I would suggest is dress to impress. Um, it, it sounds traditional, it sounds old fashioned, but what we wanna see is people that really value the opportunity to interview for the job and take pride in the fact that they've been given that opportunity. Be punctual, um, and by punctual, I would suggest being about 10 or 15 minutes early. Um, what we want to see is people that um, have great time management skills and part of your time management skills is um, allowing time for parking or for transport issues or finding the place and it's so much easier to be relaxed in an interview if you're not watching your clock and trying to read a map to find out what room you're in and where you have to go and whether or not you've, you've got all your documents prepared um, for, the, for the interview. So, Allow yourself ample time to be there. Um, it, I, I can't stress that enough, that's really important. Be confident and keep cool. Um, we wanna see that you are able to cope under stress. That, that's the essence of nursing and midwifery, um, is that we are frequently in situations that cause our heart rate to, to, um, to run high, um, but we want to see that you're able to um, control that to a degree. Um, again, my top three tips here in blue, um, be interactive and keep eye contact. What we're essentially looking for is people that are able to relate to patients um, and to families. So patients and families are incredibly vulnerable when they're accessing our health service. 
um, they're stressed, they're emotive, um, often fatigued, terrified. Um, we need people that out of all the skills that you have, you're able to interact with them and you're able to relate to them um, and provide that sort of care um, that, that patients deserve. So this is a, a, a way of us having a look and seeing whether or not you know, we can train you in the skills, we can support you to, to, provide na to put a nasogastric down or to cannulate or to take blood or, or attend a rapid response and do CPR. They're technical skills that we can actually train you to do. What we want to see is that there's an inbuilt um, ability for you to actually interact with people that you don't know because that's the essence of nursing and midwifery. Be authentic and friendly for all the reasons that I just said. Honest and genuine. Now those two words are my number, are my number one um, things that I look for in any candidate that's interviewing with us. Um, if you walk into an interview and you provide me with word for word the policy document, I am not overly impressed with that. Um, what I want to see is honesty um, and a genuine response. And I'll, um, I'll talk through that in a moment. And my other tip, um, which is valuable, but not one of my top three, is don't focus on one panel member or what they're doing. So um, typically we have a panel minimum of three on a panel. Um, some of us will write a lot of notes during an interview and some of us won't write many notes at all. Um, what we often see is that candidates will focus on the person potentially not writing as many notes in an attempt to impress them. So what I would suggest, and this is just a tip, is that when you are uh, addressing um, a panel and you've been asked a question, is that to try and move your eye contact through the whole panel. Okay, some common mistakes. Now, I'm, I'm the first to admit that some of these mistakes are ones that I've made myself during my career. Others are ones that I have observed or um, certainly colleagues have reported to me. So <clears throat> the number one um, mistake I've written here is over preparation. And I must confess, this is one that I have certainly done before. Um, been super eager, uh, eager to impress um, a panel and I have studied and I have read and I've prepared. Um, <clears throat> the problem is, is what that does is that when you walk into an interview and you're already feeling a bit nervous, is that mentally you're overloaded and this can often lead to your thought processes becoming jumbled. Um, and what that then flows onto, it's kind of like a cascade, is that then you get to a position where you've learned all this stuff that you want people to know that you know, um, and then you tend to try and slot it into a question that it really doesn't make sense um, to, to be in. So prepare, and that's why I said before, write your notes, read your notes, understand your concepts, and then discard your notes and trust your instincts. Uh, failing to engage with the panel, well, I think we covered that one off before. Failing, listening, failing to listen to questions is a big one. So we understand when nerves are high that it can be difficult to process information, but communication is one of the primary causes of near misses and clinical incidents in our healthcare setting. So staff frequently report misinterpreting instructions, not knowing, not understanding, or being afraid to ask questions. That's in the clinical space. During an interview, what we wanna see is candidates that will listen to instructions, in this case, interview questions, take time to process the information, and that's okay if you need to take time to process the question. Ask questions to clarify, if in doubt, ask and provide a response that's appropriate for your position. So if you are interviewing for a transition to practice new graduate position, I wouldn't expect the same detail to a cardiac arrest question as what I would, for example, for a nurse practitioner that was interviewing for the emergency department. So we always expect answers that are in alignment with the position that you're interviewing for. But the number one thing that I want to see is that you take time to process the information um, and that if in doubt that you're willing and able to um, ask for clarification. The other thing is um, only answering part of the question. So 
often questions will have two parts. Um, sometimes we lose the second part whilst answering the first. Um, and I think it's really important that if we're asking a two part question, um, that you're actually very well aware um, of the need to answer the second part of the question. So often it might be similar to your application and it might be um, regarding uh, knowledge and then um, demonstrated ability to put that knowledge into practice. So when it comes to answering the whole question, um, there is a technique that um, we advocate for and that you may want to use. Um, and that is the STAR technique, which is the situation. So describe a situation you're in. Task, which is tell them what you decided to do. Action, which is describe what you actually did. And result, which is tell them what happened as a result of your actions. Now, this doesn't have to be um, a light bulb moment or a moment in which you saved a life. It might actually be an event where um, your actions didn't fit the situation and the result may actually be that you reflected um, on your practice, that you researched, that you spent time with your educator, um, that you looked at some policies and procedures. So for example, um, a question might be, um, New South Wales Health expects staff to adhere to core values. When have you used the core values in your, nurse experience, uh, in your nursing experience? So you might choose to open the answer of uh, the answer with um, identifying what the core values are. So collaboration, openness, respect and empowerment. We get that thrown at us every single interview, um, which is great. It means people know what it is, but what we want to see is that they use it in their practice. So using the STAR technique, what you can actually say is um, there was a patient that I was looking after as a student nurse or as a student midwife um, who was due to have an operation but had lots of questions and didn't understand the operation. So task, um, what did you decide to do? You may actually say, so I recognise that this um, was an important issue to address because um, this may mean that consent was not informed. Action, describe what you did. So you could tell us that you notified the registered nurse in charge or the nurse unit manager of the ward and then the results. So we would like to um, hear and understand what actually happened from that. And so the results might be in this example that the surgical registrar came and spent time with the patient um, and went through um, and re-signed the consent form. So, that's an example of taking the core values, which is in this case, empowerment and openness. So um, we've empowered the patient by in, um, providing them with um, uh, more access to information and ensuring that their consent is, in, is um, informed um, and openness in the sense that we're, we are looking at open communication um, and collaboration between teams. Okay, so you've got through all the questions, you've taken a big deep breath, um, you've had a sip of water and everyone has told you, okay, that's it for our questions now. Do you have any questions for us? Now, this is the bit where you all say, absolutely I do, okay? So what do you say when it's your turn to ask questions? Most candidates are thinking, oh my God, I actually got through that and I'm alive. Um, and most panel members at this point are going, oh my God, I hope they don't ask us any questions because what if I don't know the answer? Um, but what we would love to hear and we always love to hear is questions from our candidates. So I've given you a couple here that um, I love to hear. Um, and these are some of the ones that were asked from successful um, students last year that are, are now currently doing their um, new graduate program with us. So some of the examples, and you may have more, and I welcome and I look forward perhaps at the end of the year to hearing some of them, um, might be what prospects are there uh, for personal and professional development within your facility? Um, what are the facility plans for the future? Um, what do you like best about working for health or this hospital? Um, and what opportunities are there to specialise or remain within your facility, wherever that may be? after completing the new graduate program. All of these questions show us that we have a candidate that's interested in not only our facility, but our community. 
Um, and that's really, really important in rural and remote nursing. Um, the lines between um, work and community are not the same as what they are in a metro setting. Um, and we really hold quite dear to us at that connection that we have with our community. So what we wanna see is candidates that are interested in working for us um, and interested in um, becoming part of our facility and our wider community. So come up with some great questions of your own. Um, we would certainly be really excited to hear from them, okay? I've popped an extra slide in here um, because I don't know if any of you are aware, but there's been this little thing called COVID-19 this year. Um, it has certainly been keeping us well and truly occupied, even out here in the, um, in the bush. But um, we obviously are very aware that this may change the way in which you progress to have your interviews um, later in the year. So interviewing online can be quite challenging. Um, I certainly um, am empathising with you all right now because I'm sitting in my office talking to a computer screen. Um, so there may be some different challenges that you will face this year. So recommendations for interviewing online, and we do do um, online interviews occasionally, uh, would be to do an equipment check and make sure your computer or your phone is fully charged. I have sat through several um, interviews where there has just been constant IT malfunctions. Um, and sometimes that's due to the fact that the candidate has not adequately prepared for the interview. Ensure that your lighting is um, suitable so that we can actually see you. Um, body language is um, something that most panel members will pick up on. Um, and, and it's something that we certainly, as nurses and midwives, we are um, taught to uh, interact and, and to be very well aware of the, the body language signals that our patients um, and family will give us. Make sure your surroundings are appropriate. I think we've seen some amazing things um, since COVID and Zoom meetings and working from home um, of, of people walking past behind you, wearing potentially inappropriate outfits. Um, so it's really important that you're in a nice quiet space that you may, you know, you're not going to get interrupted um, and that you've got time to be in a really good headspace because you're not being distracted. Um, still dress to impress, at least from the waist up. Um, you can wear your pyjama bottoms underneath, um, but still make that effort and show that you're, show your panel members that you, you're genuinely interested in working for them. Um, Maintain eye contact and speak into the microphone. Uh, I have that down as a tip, but I must say that's a real challenge, certainly sitting here tonight, um, speaking to myself uh, and, and hopefully um, having you all listen. So I understand that that can be a challenge. And remember that there may be a delay in transmission depending on the, in, the internet connection. So allow for pauses. Um, and hopefully I've done that tonight. Otherwise, I'm not really good. Okay. So in summary, the interview is an opportunity to showcase what you know and what you're capable of. Your application gets your foot in the door. The aim of an interview is to, to determine whether or not you have co competency in the core skills um, related to the role and to determine if you're a good fit to our team and to the organisation. So if nothing else, if you take nothing else away from tonight other than great photos um, and sitting down with us for, for a period of time, the thing that I want you to remember is that whenever you interview, be honest, be genuine and be engaging. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sam. That was, that was fantastic. Um, now, guys, I think we've got a few questions um, that have popped up. Um, what's happened here with my screen? Oh, there we go. That's all good. Um, so, yes, yeah, Sam, did you want to go through the, Q, uh, the chat or, or would, would people like for me to unmute them? If you want to just let us know in the chat if you're happy to um, be unmuted or if we're... Okay, well, I think we've got a few, um, Sam. I think there was one from, 
Trish, about the COVID and whether you thought that they will be online. You sort of went through this at the end, but it, it was sort of more if you had any inkling whether it would or, or wouldn't be online yet. Um, yeah, look, um, certainly at the moment we have, I've received some advice from our district workforce that they may be offering some online. Um, I, I think we would be more than capable of doing the social distancing and certainly there's a change um, in our organisation around face-to-face -face meetings and that sort of stuff. Um, so I, I would hope, I, I'm, I'm a face-to-face -face sort of person, um, I, I would hope that we would still be able to make some adjustments and, and be face-to-face, -face, but I'm not sure on what the Ministry has decided on that. Cool, that's great. Yeah, I think it'd be one of those things we we'll just wait around. Is that answering your question, Trish? Yeah, cool. Now, Vicky, you had a few questions. I'll just scroll up. Um, I think you might have had one about um, taking notes into an interview and whether it's appropriate to have your notes with you and then take them in with you as well or, or whether you should put them to the side. That's a great question. That's an awesome question um, because I have a an opinion on that one. Um, I would suggest, no, don't take it. So there's nothing in any of the policies um, or guidelines that say you can't. Um, the, the issue that I find is with taking notes and into an interview is that people are distracted by them um, and their natural instinct to respond um, is, is, dis is distorted. Um, so recently um, I interviewed for a nurse manager um, position in our facility and um, I had two being interviewed. Um, and this candidate who I knew was an exceptional nurse had done so much preparation. She was amazing. Um, brought her notes into the interview um, and really got distracted by the need to provide the information um, and was an un unsuccessful candidate. So um, we had some feedback after that interview, her and I, and um, she re-interviewed again for um, a, the same position um, and this time came in very genuine, very honest um, and relied on her own knowledge and instincts and she absolutely blitzed it. So my advice, um, and this is a, a personal and professional advice, is not to take notes into an interview um, because yes, we've got policies and procedures in our clinical spaces to work from, but a lot of the time we are working um, based on the knowledge that we have and the instinct that we have. And, and if you get a question um, that absolutely stumps you during an interview, it's okay to say, I'm not certain on how to answer that question. I've not come across that situation before. However, um, what I would do is that I would talk to my clinical nurse educator. I would look at um, on the internet for policy and procedure. I would ask my clinical mentor or my num, or I would escalate the situation to one of the medical officers. So again, um, there are ways of actually um, navigating through questions that you don't understand, but I wouldn't recommend taking notes into interviews. Yeah, cool. Okay, I think Vicky also had another question about, will, um, will the interviews always be on a panel? Or, um, and, and if so, how many people usually sit on that panel? Yeah, so the interviews are on a panel and that's around um, fairness um, and transparency. Um, so, and, and I certainly won't back myself into a corner of being the only person to decide, to decide on um, employment. So usually it's three. There has to be a job expert, um, a convener, so the person that's in, in charge of the panel and an independent as a minimum. So you may get panels, it depends on the position that you're going for. Um, I have sat on panels of up to five um, and um, that usually comes down to um, some different intricacies with positions, but at a minimum, there should be three for permanent employment. Cool, okay. Um, now we have a question from Amy here about, um, do we apply through New South Wales Health um, for a postgrad position or do we go through a separate application? Um, that oh, sorry, I'll, a bit new grad, I would imagine. New grad or postgrad? I think maybe you mean new, new grad, graduate. Yeah, new grad position. Um, new South Wales Health um, is my understanding. 
Um, and that will, when I did it was certainly called consortium. Um, and I would imagine that you would go to the New South Wales Health website and that will open shortly. Cool. And I can just add to that, if you have a specific interest in primary healthcare, for instance, I think there may be a um, transition to practice sort of application through APNA as well. And that will be in your resource on the, um, the digital venue, which you'll get the link to tomorrow. Okay, so another one here about interstate applications being online in person. I'm sure that's sort of similar to to anyone, but is there any exceptions to someone who is interstate, whether they can do it online, even if they are going to be in person? Uh, do you mean the application or the interview? The, sorry, the interview, I'm imagining, yeah. So um, if you're an interstate candidate, if you are in Perth or Broome um, and you're applying for a position at Burke, for example, um, there's no reason why we couldn't do an online interview. However, the um, caveat I would say around that is that I think it's really important that if you're applying for a position somewhere that you know where you're going um, and that you take some time to potentially go and see the facility um, and, and have a look around. I think that's really important as well. That's a tricky one. Cool, thank you. Um, so when do the interviews occur usually, Sam? We've got a question here from... Yep. So. Um, August was when we were doing them last year. Um, I am well aware of the fact that COVID has delayed that and I believe it's until September. Okay, cool. All right, I'm just scrolling through. Okay, what are the statistics on hiring international citizens who completed this studies here, I'm guessing in Australia. Yeah, so um, the, the way that the new graduate program works is that um, candidates are ranked on several um, different factors. Um, and I believe that the document that PIP is going to put online as resources, that will actually outline that um, more. Um, so I don't have the statistics um, on hiring of international citizens who completed their studies here, uh, but certainly I know that there's a, a different ranking and um, it, it decides on who actually gets positions. Okay, cool. Now I've got another question here from Trish. If we live on the coast and choose local to us as first preference, but Broken Hill as third or fourth preference, will that lower our chances or would we have to interview at our first preference? So I'm thinking it's uh, how does preference relate to where you interview? Yeah, so I believe that um, the way that it works is that your first preference is the location of your interview. Um, so as I said, we had six, we held 60 interviews here on site in Dubbo last August um, for only 28 positions. Um, and not all of those obviously got positions here with us. So they would then go down to their first, and uh, to their second and their third position. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, Jessica has a question here about do you have any other information on the Metro Rural Exchange Program? She can only seem to find it on the Queensland Health Metro Rural, but not New South Wales. Yeah, uh, look, I don't, um, we don't do the, uh, Dubbo doesn't do the Metro Exchange Program, but Western New South Wales certainly does. Um, and I know that I believe Concord and perhaps Nepean are involved in that Retro Rural Exchange Program. Um, and certainly it's the peripheral smallest hospital sites um, from us that are the reciprocated um, facilities. Certainly I could try and find out Pip and perhaps provide you with that information um, that you could share with the group if you like. Yeah, that'd be great. I, um, I did a little bit of reading in the handbook, the New South Wales Health um, Transition to Practice Handbook, and there is a little bit on the Rural Metro program in there, Jessica. Um, but if you will share a bit more about that and if you have any more questions, just send them through to us. I know there's a few, um, I know Broken Hill also does a rural metro. So yeah, might be a few other options out there for you. Um, okay, next question. Um, 
So can I answer, Kimberly's got a question here about being an sure. endorsed enrolled nurse in a final year of RN and that she'd love to go into remote area nursing straight away. Um, to apply for a position as junior RN is experience and or grad you preferred. So my advice um, on this one is it, that I always encourage any of the enrolled nurses within my facility to um, go ahead and do their new graduate program. Um, now, certainly I would encourage Kimberly to consider a rural um, or, or remote uh, new graduate program. And certainly we've talked about the Metro Exchange um, program and um, there are some fantastic rural programs out there. Uh, but the new graduate program is 12 months of training wheels on your bike. So uh, the, be the beauty of it and, um, is that you have the opportunity to be mentored and buddied um, to be, you know, having this access to education and, and all that sort of stuff. And yes, you do get that as a registered nurse, but the new graduate program is an opportunity to really be supported as you transition to practice. Um, I think new graduate programs are excellent. Um, and I, as I said, did my new graduate program at Broken Hill, which did actually include a remote placement. Um, I happened to to spend time at Menindee, which was fantastic for my clinical assessment skills. So my advice to Kimberly would be to um, search out for a rural and remote um, graduate program that allows you to have that support, but perhaps that experience that you're yearning for in remote area. Fantastic. That, I think that's really good advice as well. Um, okay, so I think we've got quite a good question here. Um, when job advertisements have contact have a contact person phone number listed, do you recommend contacting this person directly to advise them that you have applied for the role? Um, I think you can do that by stealth. I wouldn't advise them that you've applied for the role. Um, I would come up with a question similar to the questions that we talked about at the end of your interview. But, but I always look favor favorably upon someone who takes the time to ring up and ask about the facility. So. I would most definitely encourage people to make contact with that person. And email is a fantastic way of being non-invasive and, and bothering people if that's what you're concerned about. Drop them a line. Um, I certainly get emails all the time from um, staff sort of in, in lots of different areas wanting to, to work with us. Um, and I really do um, appreciate people that are, show the interest in doing that. I think that's a great question. Okay. Okay, we've got a question here about um, nursing quarters and um, whether nursing quarters are offered at most or all rural facilities and what's their sort of role at the moment? Yeah, so they used to be. Um, certainly, I grew up in the nursing quarters and perhaps, Pip, did you live in the nursing quarters of Broken Hill? I did. I lived in the nursing quarters in Broken Hill, Ivanhoe, ah, well, Kenya. <laughs> fantastic times. Um, yeah, a lot of sites will have some supported accommodation. Some don't, we no longer have nurses quarters here. We have a brand new multi-million dollar um, renal dialysis unit and surgical unit and maternity unit um, where our nurses quarters used to be. But um, certainly I know that our organizational development unit um, can provide some support and information around accommodation. There are some um, rural sites that still do have that supported accommodation, but again, that is potentially a great reason to contact the, the person um, on the advertisement. Um, and that might be a great lead question of, of do they have accommodation available on site? Yeah, I agree. I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, okay, so Simone has asked if, if the facility would be open to tours prior to applications or during the application period for those who are outside the area or whether people come and visit beforehand, maybe. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, I can only speak from Dubbo's perspective, obviously. Um, I don't want 50 other director of nursing's emailing me tomorrow um, because they've had tours everywhere. But I would say that there's one thing about rural and remote um, uh, healthcare facilities, and that is usually their hospitality. So if you make contact with a site and the person um, on the job advertisement and organise to, again, do a walk through um, a facility, then that is big brownie points when you come to interview for me. Um, it shows, again, that you're interested, that you're engaging, that you make well-informed decisions about jobs. Um, I had an application last year um, and was interviewing um, a person for a position 
and had the opportunity to ask them at the end of the um, position why they wanted to move to Dubbo. Um, and she said, well, I actually, I don't really want to move to Dubbo. I hate the heat, I hate the dirt. So, um, you know, she hadn't even come and, and seen the facility, wasn't aware of the facility and therefore we didn't um, proceed with her application. So um, I think it's great when people want to come and have a tour through. And certainly we did that last year with a lot of our new graduates before they came on site. Okay. okay, Amy has a good question here at the end. Um, so if you are successful, is it typically typically two or six, oh sorry, two six month rotations or might it be three four month rotations or, or something to that? Yeah, so that varies um, across uh, a lot of the LHDs, the local health um, districts and um, a lot of the sites. Uh, again, speaking from Dubbo's perspective, we do two six month rotations. Um, Typically, uh, we will do um, a general area in the first rotation. So that would be general medical, general surgical, um, extended day surgery. Uh, we do offer first rotations into theatre. Um, and then our second rotations tend to be um, more specialty areas. So emergency department, intensive care, um, internal theatre, uh, a neonatal care unit and paediatrics. So um, but we do, we do find that two six month rotations allow our staff and our new graduates ample time to consolidate their skills. So after about three months, you actually are coming to work and really feeling like you know what you're doing. After six months, you're really holding your own. So that's why the six month rotations are really advantageous. Cool. And I can add to that. I think, I think six months is probably preferenced in most places and it's what they're doing. Um, but I know Far West, when I was there and they're still doing it, is they're doing three, four month rotations, but they're, they're always evaluated at the end of the year. And I, I think it's something they really consider um, each year following the grad programs. Okay, so Joe's got a good question here. Can you clarify that we apply through the Department of Health, New South Wales, um, and is it anticipated that applications open in September? No, not open in September. Um, I would need to get that information to you, Pip, um, to ensure that I'm giving the right advice. But uh, similarly to midwifery, that is always through um, New South Wales Health. Uh, we anticipate the information that I've been provided is that interviews have been pushed back till September. So that's the interviews, not the applications. Yeah, and the, you'll find if you just Google um, Transition to Practice Program New South Wales Health or Grad Start, it is interchangeably used. Um, yeah. you'll, you'll get the information and there is a two week, or it could be one week, I could be wrong there, but there is a period of time where the application process is open. So if you just jot that into Google, you'll be taken to the correct place if you're planning to apply through New South Wales Health. Um, the university should also be providing that information on... Um, uh, how to actually apply for new start? Yeah, yeah. And if anyone has issues there, just let me know, um, or, or Sam as well, and we will be able to follow that up for you. Um, okay. So, Sam, is age a an indicator when you apply for your grad program? Um, does it matter if you apply at any different stage of life? Oh, good God, no. Um, we love um, and we have such a variety of our new graduate um, nurses. Uh, everyone has a story and everyone has something to offer to nursing and midwifery. Um, it is most definitely not a barrier um, and we have, we have grandmothers um, who have done our new graduate program in the last couple of years. So no, please, whoever um, popped that question up, please don't think that age is a, um, a barrier to undertaking a new grad program. Okay, I think I actually have a question from Chris got, um, from RDN. Oh my goodness, pressure's on. <laughs> yeah, I'll make it really hard. Sam, it's been brilliant and I, I can totally relate to um, how difficult it is just to talk to a screen um, <laughs> and not receive any feedback. I think you've done brilliantly. Thanks so much. And the feedback's been fantastic um, coming through and we'll keep asking some of the questions. But um, I had a couple of, a couple of, um, a couple of, things that um well one particular question i wanted to ask you um and a couple of comments like we do we do you know probably over a hundred interviews a year of students looking for scholarships and things and you hit on i think everything that i've ever thought about 
um, as being a panelist. You managed to articulate it back to everyone, which I thought was amazing. Thank um, God. I'd, I'd really, I'd really encourage everyone to take that on board and highlighting things like authentic, honest, and genuine. Um, I mean, it's just so important. If you've got someone who comes in and they've pre-prepared what they want to say, kind of half disregard the question and they give you what they think is just, you can't build a rapport. Um, and taking notes and things. I'm, Pip and I are almost complete opposite. Pip takes lots of notes and I don't take any. Um, <laughs> I like to try and try and build a connection with that person and that can be hard if they're, um, yeah, they're not able to engage properly. And I, I agree as well about the nervous. Everyone's nervous. I don't, I don't think there's anyone really who isn't nervous at some point when they go for an interview. Personally, I like that. If they come in and they're nervous to start with, I think it's good. It tells me that they want it. Um, and I think you're, you know, you you touched on that really nicely about then just managing to get get in control of that as the interview progresses. I thought it was great. Um, my question is um, more of the rural focus, and we've got a webinar series over the next five weeks. We're going to have great people talking about their experiences. So I'd encourage those that are online tonight, um, if you if you're interested, that to come back um, over the next few weeks. But what is it that you, you know, you, you talked about how you, you, you love it, um, you love working in, um, rurally. What is it from the work perspective in a couple of minutes and, and maybe the lifestyle perspective that, that, that you love and, and that you think makes, um, makes for a successful um, rural nurse? Uh, look, um, so I grew up rurally um, and so I know the value of country life. Um, I know that the community is, um, is so supportive of health um, in, in this setting. And, and we have seen some amazing stories in the last couple of months. Um, we have been all consumed by COVID. Um, we've had food delivered to our facility. We've had, you know, people dropping off masks from local businesses. We've had so much support. We, we've had elderly couples come in and drop cards off. We've had preschools, um, you know, doing drawings for us that we've got on display. You know, there is a real sense of connection between our community um, and our and our staff. Um, look, for me, it, it's about the fact that people deserve the care um, and they deserve the quality care and they deserve to have care closest to home um, as, as possible. And, and, you know, I, I laugh about some of the media that, that's been out and about recently around some um, issues in the city with healthcare and people having to travel an hour for specialist services. We've got people that, that travel three hours a day, um, you know, a couple of times a week for dialysis. And, and you, you want to define resilience, then you need to come and see what it's like to look after to look after rural patients, you know, I, I've, I remember seeing patients in the emergency department of Broken Hill that had, um, you know, fractured their ankles sideways, slipping down a riverbank, driven a couple of hours to come in, not wanting to bother the RFDS because they're really busy, you know, in so much pain, nothing is a hassle for them. And it just blows my mind every single day. Um, and the lifestyle I've got, I've got two kids, um, you know, we, we, we walk, we, we walk along the river, um, they're, they're in a, a school where they're important, um, because of the size of, of their school. Um, you know, I, I connect as a midwife, you know, can walk down the street and, and see people that I, I have worked with in a birth suite and, and um, helped them. Um, deliver their babies and, and, and that connection and that pride of, of knowing that I've made a difference and, and down, you know, some years down the track still remain a memory in, in their life. And that's such a privilege, um, both in good times and bad times. I mean, you know, it, and the opportunities that I've had, I would never have had in, in a metro. And Pip and I were speaking the other day as a new grad nurse. Um, I had an opportunity in an emergency department to work with a surgeon to put the intracostal um, drain in um, and actually scrub up and feel the anatomy and, 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 and just things that I would never have had a chance in, in my 20-odd um, years of nursing to do if I hadn't been working rurally. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Sam. That was, that was a great answer. Um, I'll hand back to Pip in a sec. And also there's... Um, can you get a good coffee in double? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. 
<laughs> great coffee in Dubbo. And with, press, press with the baby rhino, or with the baby hippopotamus. So, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm a big coffee person and um, I always look forward to going to Dubbo because I know that there's some fantastic <laughs> cafes out there. Um, yeah, we've got, there is. I'm just about to pop a link into the chat that I hope will come through as a link. While you're doing that, Chris, um, yep. is there anything different, Sam, about the midwifery rotations to the nursing rotations? I think someone, Renta, may have commented that in the chat earlier. As a new graduate or as a, yeah, as a new As a new grad. Yeah, no. So um, we don't um, do rotations as such as new graduate midwives. Um, we have a quite a decent sized maternity unit here. It's um, the largest maternity unit between basically um, Blue Mountains and Adelaide. Um, but we do certainly transition our midwives through antenatal clinic, um, postnatal uh, and our birthing suites um, and our day assessment units. So there's lots of opportunity to um, round off those skills that, that um, student midwives will have obtained during their training. We are a level five maternity um, service with a level four nursery, which um, also then offers midwives an opportunity to actually work in the neonatal care unit as well. Um, so we don't have structured rotations um, similar to the new grad program, but we certainly do offer um, a transition to practice with that support, but probably not as structured as what the new graduate program is. Okay, yeah, and that would probably vary depending on where you do your program. Really Absolutely, important. and where your preference is, and that's the beauty of midwifery is that you you may decide to be community-based or antenatal may be your specialty or birth suite or you want to be a well-rounded midwife that, that's capable of working and, and, and working across all those areas. So, again, opportunity is there. Cool. Okay, so someone has asked that if they're applying to their hometown where they may have lived their whole life and they know the questions about what the community's like and they know what the hospital's like, how do they show their interest in the, in the interview and how do they develop a point of difference, I guess? By being honest and being genuine um, and being engaging. So irrespective of where you grew up, um, we, we won't consider that hometown is, is an advantage. In fact, it may sometimes be a disadvantage, but all we are asking for is genuine staff. Because if you, you present your genuine self to us, then we have a lot of confidence that even if you may not have remembered every single step um, uh, of your basic life support, that you, uh, you can work with us to, um, to enhance your knowledge and your skills. So, that, that is as simple as my reply would be, to be honest. Yeah, and I agree with that. So Lisa has asked, do you have MGP at Dubbo Hospital? Um, we have a form of midwifery group practice here at Dubbo. We have a continuity of care model, um, which doesn't include birthing. So they provide continuity of care through the antenatal period and then into the postnatal period. We also have maternity in the home. Um, which is obviously the midwifery version of hospital in the home, uh, which provides um, care to women, um, especially vulnerable women and bubs, um, in their home for up to 10 days until child and family health engage with them. And we also have um, Aboriginal maternal services here. So we have um, yeah, a great Aboriginal um, maternal yeah, midwives. Okay, okay, cool. Um, now we've sort of gone through this, but... Um, if you, you move into rural areas and there's so much about lifestyle, that's great. What about if you're a mother to young children or maybe a Even father better. to children? Even better. It's a great place to bring up kids. It's a <laughs> fantastic place to bring up kids. Um, there, there's lots of opportunities in the rural setting um, to bring children up um, and to work with children. And obviously, um, as an organisation, we are supportive of flexible working arrangements. Um, to, to most extent. Um, so we, we have a lot of staff that have got children. We have a lot of new graduates that um, are mums of kids of varying ages, but it is certainly a great place. The schools, the sport, um, the opportunity for outdoor activities. Um, yeah, the, it's a great place to bring up kids. 
Yeah. Okay, so we'll probably have to wrap up in a minute. I just see one more question that could be quite good, but um, if you have any more quick questions, put them in and we'll get, we'll get to them. But, so if you're looking to do um, your, your grad program in a rural area, would you also recommend doing your uh, post-grad in midwifery to be sort of better in these rural and remote communities? Um, that's a tricky one. Uh, it depends on what your long-term plan is. So I did midwifery uh, about 18 years into my um, nursing career. Um, I specialised initially in emergency nursing um, and then I decided to round off my skills um, as I was doing sort of after hours hospital management and I felt very vulnerable in the midwifery area. Best career decision of my life. Um, I loved every moment of it. If you were going remote, then I would say that it was certainly um, a massive um, attribute to be a midwife also. Um, if you are working in some of our smaller sites, then it's always advantageous. And as a midwife, I'm, I'm happy to advocate that everyone goes, goes and does midi, um, but it's, it's not a necessity unless you're planning on really working remote, then I would advocate for it, definitely. Okay, cool. I think this is our lucky last. And then what we'll do is tomorrow when you get your thank you email is we'll, um, we'll provide this other space where we can keep all these questions going and we can keep answering and, you know, talking about all these sort of things after the webinar. So do grads do the lovely night shifts? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm renowned for being one of those crazy people that loves night shift. Um, so I have no sympathy for anyone that doesn't want to do it. No, I do really. Uh, yeah, no, they do. Um, it, it's a natural part of nursing. It's a realistic part of nursing. Um, it's a realistic part of health. Um, there is something very special about working nights and I can hear my whole entire staff that are on evening shift groaning from here now. Um, the reason I say that is that it is very pure nursing and midwifery care on night shift. There's no one around. Um, patients are extremely vulnerable on nights because it's dark. They don't have their family. Um, their mind, when they're unwell, can run away with them. So it, it's a different kind of nursing care. And I think it's really important that new graduates from early in their graduate program actually um, commence on night shift. Saying that, we don't throw our new graduates in as one of two on a 30-bed unit. Um, so we, um, we will always tailor it, and the nurse unit manager will tailor it to um, how well the new graduate's transitioning. But I'm a big advocate of having new graduates on night shift. Yeah, I got my fair share. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I think that's um, I think that's great. I think we'll finish up there. Like I said, we'll keep these conversations and questions going in um, the digital venue in Rural Health Pro. When you get that link, you may be uh, sort of sort of have to sign up and go through a few steps, but go through those processes, and then we can keep these conversations. We'll have the resources, and you'll have the recording to this session as well. And if you haven't already, join up to all our other sessions, which are to come the next four weeks. And um, yeah, if you guys, uh, Chris or Sam, want to say anything, but I think that's it from me. Have a good rest of your night, guys.